Uh, we're we're starting to talk about networking protocols. So uh, we're at the point in the semester where I now want to do like a high level overview of what we've talked about and what we plan on talking about. It's kind of difficult to show this at the very beginning because the the topics we talked about were a bit, a bit scattered. Like some, it's concurrent control, it's indexes, it's it's some storage stuff. Um, but this is sort of a conceptual uh, illustration of what the system that we're sort of envisioning in our minds that we're talking about, discussing the various topics of how to build, what it looks like. So this is our application. They send a SQL query. This is going to land in our networking layer. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Then we hit the query optimizer or the planner. So that we parse the SQL, bind to the catalog objects, do any rewriting we want to do, and then run it through our query optimizer to generate a physical plan. Then we're going to pass now this through a compiler, which won't make sense now, but we'll talk about this in a few weeks. Basically, we're going to take a, that physical plan and convert it into machine code instead of actually interpreting it. Then we have our execution engine where we're actually, we'll execute the query in, in threads. And then we have a storage manager down below. So this one, we've already talked about a bunch of stuff already. This one, we've already talked about a bunch of stuff already. So these are the, sort of the, the parts that we've already covered. Right? We've covered how to do concurrent control, indexes, storage models, and logging checkpoints. Um, so now, again, today, we're going back to the top. And then going forward, we'll sort of jump around and start here and then work our way back up. Um, this part, though, like for operating execution, we'll cover this all basically throughout the rest of the semester. Like, we'll talk about how to do parallel or vectorized hash joins, vector vectorized sorting, um, and the MVCC stuff sort of covers all of this, like at least up to the planner. Like in the back of your mind, to think about, oh, I'm working on multi a multi-version database. What are the implications of that as as I design my system? Right, so this is sort of our, our route for the, the rest of the semester. And then at the very end, the last two lectures will be like, the potpourri things would be like new hardware or doing applying machine learning methods to, to, to the stack. Okay. So as I said, today we're going to talk about the networking protocol. Uh, and this is either the data coming into the database from the client or how we send data out to our replicas for high availability. But, but the paper I had you guys read was all about uh, ingesting data, or, and, taking queries in and getting data out. So let's talk about basically how you would write in your application, the different uh, methods for accessing uh, the database and running queries. Then we'll talk about what the actual network wire protocol looks like that you're sending back responses o over the network. Then we'll briefly talk about the different replication protocols that are out there, what are the sort of setup you can have. And then we'll finish up with a sort of a, 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 two different techniques to bypass the operating system as much as possible called kernel bypass methods. So for all these, again, we assume we're going over the TCIP stack. And for simplicity, we're just assuming we're going to the OS. This is a way to, to work around them. And then we'll finish up briefly talking about what, what's expected for project two. OK? All right, so up until now, all the demos that I've given in class uh, about you know, using Postgres, or in, in the introduction class, we showed MySQL, we showed Oracle, all of those were opening up the terminal over SSH, me typing in some queries, hitting Enter, and then getting back a, a text response. So in a real application, that's not how it actually works, because what I'm getting back and showing the terminal is, is like is text. It's, 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 you know, it's characters. And so if I was writing an application where I would go through the terminal like that, I'd basically have to now parse the text field, extract out what the values I'm looking for, and convert them to the right type in my application. And that would be super slow. And nobody would actually ever do that, right? So what we're really going to do in a real program is that we're going to have a, an API, that a, a programming interface that we can then write queries against on our database. And then what we're exposed to in our application is, is binary values for the most part. If, it's, if you're getting back JSON, then not always. But like in real applications, or if, if you really care about performance, then you want to get binary data back to your application. Because then you don't have to do any, any of that conversion yourself in your application. Like, oh, I know I'm looking at an integer, but I have a string representation of that integer. Let me now convert it to, uh, to an int. So all these APIs, the, the way to get best performance is to go through sort of these, these standard programming interfaces. So we'll first talk about direct access. These are going to be a, a proprietary uh, APIs or libraries that each database vendor could provide. And then we'll talk about ways to actually now have a more generic or generalized access methods or APIs 
that potentially would we'll not have to require us to rewrite our application to use if we switch from one database vendor to another. We may have to change the SQL query dialect, uh, but if we program against these things, then this would be standardized. Okay? Yeah. All right, where was I? Sorry. Uh, right, again, the idea of these guys is that if I write my application using either ODBC or JDBC, then if I'm using MySQL today, but I decide to give IBM money and now switch my application over to DB2, I don't have to rewrite any of my application code because these things are the API for, that you would use for MySQL and, and, and DB2 would be standardized on these things. Again, SQL might have change, but like the actual code itself won't change. So the, the actually just going back real quickly. This one we're not going to talk about too much. There's nothing really to say about this other than like, like everybody has their own thing and ideally you should not program against these APIs. Right? You should always have either like a, some kind of one of these things in front of it so that, so that you make your thing more portable. In some applications, like if you know you're going to be running on a phone, you're only going to be you know, executing at SQLite, you could program it that way, but even then, like Apple or Android will provide you with a database wrapper or API that hides the fact that you're actually using SQLite. All right, so the first sort of standardized API for database systems was called ODBC. Um, and this wasn't actually, it's, it's not the first actually that was implemented. Like Sybase actually tried this back in the late 1980s where they got together with some other database vendors and some uh, application uh, pr programming frameworks and they took the Sybase API, stripped out all the Sybase specific logic in it, and tried to propose this as a standard API called DB library that everyone can use. For whatever reason, that never took off. Microsoft then hooked up with this other company called Sigma Technologies, and then they proposed in the early 1990s this thing called ODBC. And pretty much today, every major database vendor, actually whether you're relational or non-relational, is, is chances are they're, they're going to have an ODBC library. Like MongoDB has one, even though MongoDB doesn't support SQL. Uh, it's just you give them MongoDB you know, queries, and you, know, you write MongoDB queries in their syntax, but it still supports the, the API. Um, so the way it basically works is, is ODBC, they're going to follow what's called a device driver model. And the idea is that in the, on the client side, the ODBC driver is, this is something that the, the, the vendor provides, and underneath the covers, they'll have all the logic that you need to communicate with the database server over the proprietary protocol. Like if I send a query request here, this request is going to be specific to my database system. And then when I get back the result, it's up to this driver now to, to then convert it into the format that the ODBC API specifies. All right? So the parlance we're going to use for this class is that I'm going to refer to this part here. This is the part that we care about. This is the wire protocol. And again, Every database system is going to do something different, uh, unless you're following what you know, copying what MySQL and Postgres do, which is very common. But this is not going to have anything. Like this doesn't know anything about ODBC. It just knows that here's some SQL queries and here's a result. Now the ODBC API does have additional things or it has certain features that not every database system is going to be able to support. But you can essentially emulate that through on the client side in the driver. So for example, if your database system doesn't support cursors. So a cursor is like, if I run a SQL query, instead of getting back all the results at once, I can get a handle, a cursor handle to that result, like an iterator, and I can call get next, get next, get next, and that'll send a message over the network to get back the next query. You would do this if, like, if, you're, if your result is huge and you don't want to ship everything all at once. So not every database system supports cursors, so you can fake that through the ODBC library. So you can still call through ODBC in your application, hey, give me a cursor. Underneath the covers, they'll send the SQL query, get back all the results, but then expose to you like the, the, the iterator API to, to walk through the cursor. So that's sort of nice that you, that you can hide all that complexity uh, if you don't support everything that you need for ODBC uh, in the driver itself. Right? So um, the other important thing to understand too is that the, the ODBC standard specifies what the, you know, a, a fixed term, uh, specifies what the data types are that you're going to get when you say, like, give me an integer from this, you know, from, this, from this result set. And so it's up for the driver to make sure that whatever the, the, the ODBC driver API specifies as a data type, that it has to give that to you in your application. So that way you don't have any unexpected results and it makes it more portable. So for example, if we store every integer as 64 bits for whatever reason, and then the ODBC API says, give me a 32-bit integer, 
When I get back the 64 bit integer from the server, again, I have to convert that to, to 32 bits, because that's what the, the, the API specifies. So again, that's all trying to hide the, uh, the specifics or the nuances of, of every single database system right, by, through this, this client or driver model. Um, all right, so the other more common one, too, is JDBC. And the way to think about this is like ODBC, it's not specific to Windows anymore, but it sort of came out of that environment. And so that's sort of designed for C or C++ applications. JDBC is designed for Java-based applications, for applications that are designed to run on the, on the JVM. So this was developed by Sun uh, in 1997, when, when, as sort of a few years after they, they released the, the Java runtime and the Java language. And again, the idea was that they recognized that they wanted Java applications to run in the enterprise. Those things, enterprise applications, need to talk to, to relational databases or SQL databases. So you, JDBC was their attempt to standardize an API for this. Um, and again, like I said, like, you think of ODBC is, is for C, and JDBC is obviously for Java. And so what's going to be slightly different, though, in, in JDBC is that because they're running the Java runtime, um, they're not always going to have uh, a driver written in Java. It's more common now, but back in the day, not so much. Right? For, for ODBC, yes, if you, if you release your driver, uh, ODP driver, it's, it's going to be in C, right? and that would be universal enough. So sort of as a way to bridge people uh, to be able to use JDBC before there was enough drivers written in Java, then they have a bunch of different levels or, or connectivity uh, methods you can use to communicate with the database system. So the first one is exactly as I was saying. So you, instead of having the, the JDBC driver communicate directly with the database system, you have a little bridge uh, middleware sitting in front of it that converts JDBC commands into ODBC commands. And then ODBC then communicates to the database system over its proprietary wire protocol. So this is actually not supported anymore as of, like I think, JDK 1.8. But And this is actually was a pain in the ass to set up. I had to do this for times 10 when we do some testing here. It, it's a nightmare. Uh, it was really finicky, but like again, this is a, this is a stopgap solution in, in case JDBC didn't have exactly what you wanted for, the, for your particular database system. The next approach is to have the JDBC calls just invoke the proprietary native API of the database system, right? Again, so SQLite would be the best way to think about this because SQLite's an embedded database system, so it's going to be running inside your same process as your application. So you could have the JDBC driver invoke through JNI to the C commands to execute queries or open up cursors or tables on the, the, on the database system. But th I don't think this would work if, you, if you're going over the network. This is only for embedded, uh, embedded databases running in the, in the same process. The next approach is to have a, the JDBC driver communicate with some other middleware system that then knows how to then speak the wire protocol of the of the database system. So it's sort of like the first one, but the idea here is that the, the commands coming out of, the, of, of JDBC are sort of generic for JDBC, but then when they land on this middleware that the database system would have to provide, it then knew how to convert, convert that into the wire protocol that you expected. Right? Whereas this thing is, is sort of, the JDBC is invoking ODBC commands. The last one, which I, in my opinion is the best one, uh, is where the database, the, so the, the, the JDBC implementation itself can invoke uh, or send the packets that you need for the wire protocol of the database system. So this is not, wasn't that common uh, so much in the early days, but it's, it's more common now. Uh, like you can download a Postgres implementation or Postgres JDBC driver purely written in Java, and you don't need to worry about any of the, the, the C stuff. And this will run the fastest because, again, you just go natively from Java over the network to get the packets and, and get everything back. Right? So this one, um, this one I think, not uh, actually, this one you sort of see in, um, in other languages. Like if you want to have, like if you, if, you, if you have some obscure programming language, uh, Rust or Go aren't secure in, or obscure. But like in the early days, there weren't a lot of drivers written for uh, for different databases in Go and Rust and whatever language you want to use. So you would, a stopgap solution would be this thing would wrap around like ODBC. You would have a Go wrapper around the ODBC driver, which was written in C. And, but that means, again, you have to then go out of the, the, the Go runtime into the C program to send these commands, whereas if you have a native Go implementation, 
Okay, that's going to be way faster because there's less copying of packets or less copying of buffers. So this, this was always going to be a better way to do this. So as I said, all of the database systems are going to implement uh, their own proprietary wire protocol. And these are, as far as I know, I don't know of any other system that doesn't do this, everything is going to go over TCP IP. I don't know of any database system that goes over UDP. Uh, and it would be tough to do if you want to support transactions because you don't know whether your packets are actually going to show up and you would need to send back acknowledgments. Um, so for that reason, everyone's going over TCP IP. Now above that, they could have additional uh, confirmation messages and back, back, you know, to say, like, did you get this packet? Yes, I got this packet like at the application level, but of course TCP is going to do that for you under the covers as well. So the typically way, the way the, the client's going to interact with our database server is that they're going to connect to the database system, they'll go through some kind of authentic authentication process, like username, passwords, Kerberos keys, things like that. Um, if most systems also now support SSL by default, so you go through that process to encrypt the, 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 the channel, then you send over a query, the database system executes that query, serializes the results, sends that back over the wire protocol to the client, and the client can then hand that off to, to the application code. So what we're going to focus on today, and the paper you had you guys read, was focusing on this problem here. How do you actually serialize the data and, and get out of it? Because this is actually where the opportunity for optimization is actually available. There, there are things that we can improve, right? There's not much we can do for this. There's not, much, there's not really uh, much optimization we can do for this, because most SQL queries are going to be short, right? They're just strings we send over. You can then maybe say I run these as prepared statements or store procedures, but that's just reducing the size of the message. Most queries aren't that big. There's some applications I've seen uh, or heard from uh, people in the wild where like the SQL query could be like 10 megabytes. Uh, you see this at like uh, big big corporations where they have like the internal dashboards to do like reporting, and you can click a bunch of options to like you know. Get all the people from a zip code or some, some you know some geographical region, and then you you sort of you click all the options you want for the query. You click go, and then that converts whatever you clicked on the dashboard into a SQL query. And sometimes you can have these really long in clauses, like where zip code in, and then you know, list of every single zip code. And in that case, the SQL query can get really big. But the only optimization you really can do for that is just uh, compress it with like Snappy or Gzip, whatever you want to use. Right. So there's not really any techniques we can do in a database system to make this go faster. Um, so we're, we're going to be focused on, on, on this one here, right? So I say all major database systems implement their own proprietary word protocol. protocol. Um, that's not entirely true. Question? Um, are there any systems that do like kind of like a client side, like basic SQL bits? Because I'm sure like some of the stuff where it's like, you know, when like two is two equals one plus one and that kind of thing. Ah, so good question. So the question is, are there, uh, are there any database systems where the client can actually be somewhat intelligent and maybe I mean, do compression, uh, maybe do some query rewriting before it sends it to you? Uh, I was also going to think you can also maybe do client-side query caching as well. Um, not really for a couple of reasons. Um, the, so the example you gave is like, can I do query rewriting? I don't know of anybody that does that in the client driver because, uh, like, convert you know one equals one you know two equals one plus one. Can I convert that just to be true? Uh, because you basically would need to implement that logic to parse the SQL statement, understand the semantics of what the where clause is actually doing on the client side. Then now you also need to, if you're supporting a bunch of different programming languages, and you're using having native drivers for those things, now you got to rewrite all that in every single language. For that reason, nobody, no, I don't think anybody does that. I, there, is, there was a system called FoundationDB, which was a distributed key value store that Apple bought. It is now open source. Snowflake uses it internal for, for the metadata, but they only use it as a key value store. When, before, Founda before Apple bought FoundationDB, DB, what they would do is they added the SQL layer, and all that would do was, in the client, they would convert your SQL statement into individual get, get queries a get command you would send for the key value store. So that's, one, that's the only example I can think of offhand they do this kind of stuff. Other things like caching query results, well, if, if you don't know what's in the database server on the client side, how do you know that like, you have the latest version? So, you, so for this reason, everyone always, go, always goes to the network. Um, there, I have thought about this. We haven't pursued it yet. But like, uh, there was some research done 
up in Waterloo where like uh, you could provide hints about like, hey, I'm sending you this query, but oh, by the way, I'm going to execute these other queries pretty soon as well. But I don't think any, that makes it any commercial system. The client drivers are usually pretty brain dead. Just like, give me this query, here's the result. Yes? Yeah, why do we actually need all of this? Like, why can't we use the existing protocol, protocols to send the data across the network? What would be an existing protocol? Sorry? Like, what's it, when you say, why can't we just use an existing protocol, what, what do you mean? Like, like, what, like TCP IP? I mean, yeah, like exactly how the you know communication works over the over the servers, like sending data across. Why do we need to you know serialize the results and you know? No, I, I so I think what you're saying, are you when you say existing protocols, do you mean at like at the lower level in the stack, like at TCP/IP level, or do you mean like at the application level? Like at, at the application. Right, so, so, what, so what's an existing protocol? To send, send uh, packets across the network, it's TCP IP. That's TCP IP, but that's, that's a layer below. We're, we're above, we're in, the, we're in the database server. So, so it, it's one of those existing protocols. So, so my question is, what, what's an existing one? It's a leading question, because it's the next slide. <laughs> okay, so, right, so as I was saying, like, all the major database vendors, like Postgres, MySQL, the other big three, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, pretty much everyone implements their own wire protocol from scratch. But where I thought you were going to go uh, is that most of the newer systems, however, don't do this. And they, they implement an existing one, in particular, Postgres and MySQL. Right? And the benefit of doing this is that, and we do the same thing in our system we're building here, is that now I don't have to worry about supporting a bunch of different programming languages for my drivers, right? For JDBC and ODBC. I can just, if I speak the Postgres wire protocol, then anybody that comes along with a, you know, the, the, the Postgres driver in Rust, they can just use that Postgres driver and communicate with my database system. Now, these aren't going to be the best protocols, and we can talk offline the troubles we've been having with the Postgres one. Um, but if you think about it, if you're a database startup or you're, like, you're, you're a research project like us, do you want to be spending your time on writing client drivers for every single programming language in order for people to use your, your database, or can you just piggyback on what's already been done in a large ecosystem and have people just you know, use what's already there? So that's why this is actually very, very common. So, but I will say, though, sometimes you'll see in the documentation that, oh, we are Postgres compatible. Or, uh, you see in the documentation of these different database systems, we're Postgres compatible or MySQL compatible. But just because they speak the wire protocol doesn't mean they're actually truly compatible. Right? They're not always going to be an exact drop in replacement because there's a bunch of other stuff that are, are specific to that you know, Postgres and MySQL that you may not actually be emulating in your server or in, in your new system. And you, therefore, it's not going to work. You know, your application code you know, using JDBC or ODBC may start sending SQL queries in a dialect that your server doesn't support, and it's not going to work. Right? So this will get you the sort of, the, by, by following their protocol, you'll get the transport to go from the client to the server correct, but then this query shows up, and now, now what do you do? Right? It's not going to be exactly the same. Other times, too, there'll be queries that, like, if you don't support the same catalog structure as Postgres and MySQL, a lot of these like, visualization tools, the first thing you do when they turn them on is they go look in the catalogs and figure out what tables you have, what columns you have. But if you don't speak that, uh, if you're not formatted the same way, that Postgres MySQL are, then that's going to break. Then there's other things too, where like the tools may go at the, the database server in at, at sort of a, a physical level, like looking at files on disk. Like there's a lot of extensions and tools for Postgres that can manipulate the actual files of the database without actually having to go through the, the database system itself. None of that's going to work because underneath the coverage, your system is going to be completely different. Yes. I have a question. So like for like the Postgres uh, protocol and the MySQL protocol. The drivers essentially this just like write a string of SQL into some function that magically like writes that over a network into a uh, like a socket and then like get some result back in some form. In the, so his question is, what do these drivers actually look like? Is it at the bare bones? Are they just like here's a SQL string? You say go run this for me, and then that goes gets converted into the the, the packets to send to the database system. You get a result, and then you get back some data in some binary form. In the most simplest form, yes. But if you start doing like uh, prepared statements or cursors, like 
you can specify like here's the query template I want to use, and then the first value is in, second value is a double. Like there's there's the, the API is actually kind of big, um, and all of that won't be you know passing everything just through a SQL string. There are ways to construct queries programmatically through the API that isn't just hey here's the SQL string. Okay. And then the again the the API specifies says you know when you get back a result and you call next row. Uh, the you know when you say you know for this current row give me the, the the third tuple or give me the third field as an integer, it needs to know that I, I'm going to get back a thirty-two bit integer, not some other thing that your 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 data system is storing internally. So like SQLite stores everything as var chars underneath the covers, and it's only when it gets exposed outside the database system then it gets converted to the, the correct binary form. So the, the driver would have to handle that. Yes. Front, front, front row. Yes. Uh, so SQL does support caching right now, right? Like you can turn on caching. So my question. So, is, SQL or SQL Server? Um, SQL Server. Sure. All right. So that's a, that's the implementation, yes. Yeah. So my question is, why, why is it so different to implement caching in the client side? Uh, what is the different client side caching and server side caching? No. Why is it different to like you you talked about caching on the client end and yes. saying that you don't know the state of the server, so yes. it's not really a good idea. Right? Yes. So why is it so different? Uh, from caching it on the server okay. end itself. So his question is, is I made a comment about the client-side caching versus server-side caching. Server-side query result caching would be I, I send a SQL query, it does some, some complex calculation, I send back the result to the client, but then I also remember that I execute that, that SQL query with the result. So now someone comes along and executes the same SQL query, I don't have to recompute it, I just get back the same result. So, an alternative could be that the client could do this. So if the client says, I executed the same SQL query you know, a few seconds ago, here's the result, just reuse that. The problem is, if you, if you care about having uh, the data be fresh and up to date, on the client side, I don't know if somebody else came in and modified the tables and therefore invalidated my cache result. So you'd have to like, so think about how you actually implement this. You could then say, like, the client could, could go to the database server and say, hey, has the state of this, of this has, has this cache result been invalidated, yes or no? Then, if yes, then you re-execute query. If no, then you, you just reuse what you've done. I don't think anybody actually does that, though, because it's sort of one extra round trip. Okay, but if it's like a huge query, it can make a difference. Oh, absolutely. The question is, if it's a huge query, it can make a difference? Absolutely. If my query takes an hour to run and I can cache it, fantastic, right? So we're not going to talk about it this semester. Uh, uh, it's also not an area that I, I fully understand myself. Um, you can kind of get this on the database service side. So query result caching isn't always good because it's, it's like coarse grain. It's like you have to cache the result for the entire SQL query. So like if I say, you know, uh, if, the, if the giant select query has a, has a predicate where I say where name equals Andy, I cache that, then your query shows up with your name. I can't reuse any of the things that I computed, even though maybe one piece has changed. So a very common thing to do is what's called materialized views, where you can actually materialize pieces of that query. And so like, maybe you pre-materialize some expensive join, and then the predicate just comes in and knows how to do a filter on that materialized query. And the high-end servers, like SQL Server in particular, can know how to like, reuse the materialized views across different queries. Right? But again, for your example, you, like, you would need an explicit cache and validation message and I don't think anybody system actually does that, right? Um, all right, so you had a question too, yes. Yeah. So for curses, right, you told that like if my database does not support curses and it can give back the whole result and then they can, uh, the client side can yes. go one by one, right? Yes. But even if like my database supports curses, why will I always return only one tuple? Like, won't it make sense to return a good amount of the result and then like, otherwise it will be like going back and forth? Yeah, so his question is, so the question is, why would I ever want to have a cursor where I return one tuple at a time versus like just sending everything all at once? So I think cursors, I think, I don't know the exact details, like I think they vary per system. They don't, I mean, it's not just one query, because that'd be one, be one packet, one message to get one result. They send a batch. Okay. But the question is, do I send, you know, if I have a million results, do I send all one million or do I send 10,000 at a time? So basically, if your data does not support cursors, then it has to send one million only. Correct. The statement is, if, it, if your data system doesn't support, support uh, cursors, you have to send one million results. Yes. Okay. And again, think about, like, um, think about, how, like, 
Think about what a database server would look like versus what an application server would look like. A database server is usually going to be running on high-end software. Now, if it's a distributed database, the world's different. But like, think of like, you know, a, a big, heavy, expensive machine that's kind of a lot of memory, fast disk. The application servers can be these you know, off-brand uh, EC2 instances. They're not going to have as much memory. So maybe I don't want to blast it with all 1 million tuples. That's sort of the thinking of it, right? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what difference, I actually don't know what difference, how different data systems do different things, right? Because also too, like, you could imagine, the, the way you implement cursors could be different too, because like, it could be, I execute the query, I now buffer the result, and you can call get next on the cursor, and I'm just feeding through that. Or, I could have it be set up where I have a pipeline breaker where I say, here's the final result of the query, uh, and call get next, get next, inside the execution engine, get a bunch of tuples, but once I reach my cursor limit, then I hand that back to the client, because maybe they're not going to come back and ask for more. If they do come ask for more, then I'll just now execute the rest of the query. You could stage it that way. I think everyone buffers it, and then gives you a handle to the cursor of the buffer. But you could implement it the other way. I think that's how it was originally envisioned. Back, but this is like the 1980s. In the pipeline model. In the pipeline, uh, not the pipeline model, but like the, the, the volcano model. The volcano model. Wait, which, yeah, it is yeah, the pipeline. It's the, pipe. it's the pi volcano iterator pipeline model, yes. Same thing. OK. So uh, this is just a table showing what, uh, you know, what other systems are actually using the MySQL Postgres wire protocol. I thought there were actually even more systems using Hive. Uh, but the only one I can find that speaks to the Hive wire protocol is Spark. Um, so MySQL is very common. A bunch of these, though, are hacked up versions of MySQL. Like MemSQL in the very beginning actually wasn't a, uh, it was not a full-fledged database system. It was a storage engine like InnoDB or RocksDB that sat underneath MySQL. So they got the MySQL you know, compatibility and wire protocol for free. Eventually, they ripped all of that out and they wrote everything themselves because they otherwise you'd violate the, G the GPL and they're proprietary. But so they basically speak the, the MySQL protocol now. So they are My MySQL compatible. Clusterx is based on um, uh, MySQL, but it had sort of a, a layer above that that was distributed. So there's a, there's a framework called MySQL proxy that gives you like a gives you like a middleware front end implementation of the MySQL wire protocol. And a bunch of these other ones are sort of, again, speaking the wire protocol. Our Amazon Aurora is slightly different. Uh, we'll talk about, that, talk about that in a second. Here's a bunch of these ones that are based on Postgres. So a couple of these are written from scratch, like Hyper, CockroachDB, our old system, Umbra. These are systems where like, we, we looked at the specification of the, of the Postgres wire protocol and re-implemented it to, in our system. Things like Redshift, Greenplum, Vertica, and I think maybe Yugabyte, these are, they, they, the original code base started with Postgres, and they ripped out the, the parts they didn't want, and then rewrote it for, that, to do whatever it is they wanted to do. So they kept the, that front end piece of code, the networking layer, for, uh, for Postgres. So the reason why Aurora is different um, is because, because Amazon controls the whole stack of like, if you're running in, 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 in their cloud center, they, they control the networking layer, the execution layer, and the storage layer. So what they do is actually super interesting, at least for MySQL. I don't know if they do this for Postgres. They actually take out some of the networking logic for the wire protocol for MySQL and shove it up into the Amazon like, load balancing networking layer. Right? So now when you hit, like, when your application speaks to your database instance uh, and running in Aurora, you may not actually be hitting up the actual Aurora system itself. You're running up in, in, this, networking, uh, in this, network, uh, this networking layer up above that does some load balancing for you, which is really fascinating. And what they can do is they can switch over uh, uh, sort of transparently from one instance to another. Like if, say, I, I'm running on a, on a small machine, I'm going to upgrade Amazon to a, a, my Aurora instance to a bigger machine. In the networking layer, because it's now decoupled from the actual database server, they can uh, copy over your session variables from, from, you know, from all your clients from one server to the other, and then just have the networking layer switch over to the the new instance, and it looks like you magically just got more, 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 you know, more RAM, more CPUs, without actually, you know, closing any of your connections. So that's crazy, and I think only Amazon can do that because it's Amazon, right? So uh, we can take this offline. Implementing this has been a huge pain in the ass. It's been awful. Uh, you can talk to Matt about it. This is our third attempt trying to reimplement the Postgres wire protocol, and it's it's really ugly because um, they have two different modes, which is a mess. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the paper you guys read today uh, for this class. So 
as I said, the, the where we can have opportunity to get uh, better performance and, and, and improve the wire protocol is when we serialize the data back to the client. Right? We can ignore the cursor stuff, assume that they ran a query, and they want, uh, they want a bunch of results. And the paper you had you, had you guys read uh, came from the same authors that are building DuckDB, or the, the original people that are also working on MoneyDB at a CWI. And what they were focused on was doing these large data exports. So not so much running complex queries and getting back a, you know, aggregated results, but I have my Python or data science application running somewhere else, and I have all my database, my data in my SQL database. How quickly can I get that data out and put it into my, my, my machine learning pipeline? So a lot of the things we're talking about today look like all the storage stuff we talked about before. Right? How to do compression, how to do the row versus column stuff. Because that's essentially what it is, right? We're, we have some giant chunk of data. What's the optimal way that we should organize it to send it over the wire? And it's basically the same thing. If you want to store a bunch of data on disk or in memory, what's the optimal way to do that, right? So the other thing I'll say too also is that everything we're going to talk about here, uh, whatever, however we organize the data on the server side, and then send it over to the client, the client has to be able to interpret that and reverse it. So that's going to somewhat limit uh, what we can actually do because we don't want to burden the, the client with actually doing a, a ton of work. Now, again, they're focusing on doing these bulk exports of the data, um, but a lot of times the same client driver you would use in other systems, like the same client driver you would use for your, your Android application would be the same client driver you would use for whatever, your, your, your applications are running on a you know, giant Xeon box. So now no one's downloading a terabyte of data to their cell phone, that's stupid, right? But like, it just means that we need to be able to support whatever the optimizations we have apply here for the data. We have to be able to reverse them and interpret them. So that, that means that we can't be too heavyweight because um, uh, we don't want to have to duplicate that, that, that logic in a bunch of different locations. Right? Like, again, if I want to support all the different programming languages and I have native drivers for each of those programming languages, whatever I need to do to decompress data in one language, I got to do it for another one. Right? So it's sort of like the lowest common denominator, which, which is somewhat limiting, but it is what it is. All right. So the first thing is going to be to talk about is the row versus column. So the ODBC and JDBC are inherently row oriented APIs. We we're gonna, the servers are always going to package up the tuples uh, and the results one tuple at a time and sort of package that as a single message that sends, gets sent over the network. Now, we can stream a bunch of messages all at once, but the way these, these, the servers are mostly written is that it assumes that I'm going to iterate on the, on the server side over one tuple at a time. I'll construct a message that says, here's what's actually in this tuple, and I put as many of those messages in, up as I can to my packet, ship that over, and then the client has to reverse that. So, Back in the 1990s, when they first started building ODBC and JDBC, this made sense. Because it was, you were either running OLTP applications where the result sets are small, like go get Andy's account record, go get all the orders that Andy bought from Amazon. That, that's not a lot of data, and there's not, not a lot of tuples. Um, if you're doing analytics, uh, oftentimes it would just be you know, computing the, 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 the sales totals of, you know, on a quarterly basis, and then you're doing some aggregations on that. So like the query, the query is a bit more complex than on the OTP side, but the amount of data you're getting back is not, it's not a lot. But again, as I said, the, the DuckDB guys are focused on exposing the database contents to these modern machine learning uh, uh, software. And in this world, we want things as, as columns or matrices. So this row-oriented approach is, is, is limiting. So what they propose to do is that instead of sending over in, you know, in, in a row-oriented format, we could actually send it over as, as vectors. And in particular, the way they're going to do this is they're going to organize a bunch of tuples together and within in a block, and then within that block, they'll be organized as columns. So it's not like I'm going to stream over one column at a time in a bunch of messages, and then when I'm done with that column, switch over to the next, next column and do that. They're going to say, here's a bunch of tuples, convert it as a, uh, as a column store within that block, and then ship that block over. And then for the next uh, batch of tuples on the server side, you do the same thing. So we didn't talk about this exactly when we, were, when we talked about uh, storage layouts, um, but this is called the PAX model. Um, it was actually invented not here at CMU, but, but, but by a professor who used to be here at CMU, and now she's at EPFL. 
Um, and this is actually what we do in our database system now. Uh, we organize our data as one megabyte blocks, and then within that block, we have all the attributes or fields for a single tuple, but each of those fields are going to be organized as, as a column store. Because we follow what we follow what Arrow does. And this is used in Parquet, used in Orc. Yes? Is this system still effective for row weights APIs, or is it better just to stick to latency? The question is, is um, is, sorry, is, is, is this approach still effective for, for ODBC? So again, ODBC doesn't know about any of this. ODBC doesn't know that I got a batch of tuples back and they're organized as columns. It just, because the, now the programming interface is, that, is definitely row oriented, right? I, I get a cursor, I call get next, and then I do whatever I need to do on that, on that single column or, or that single tuple. I can't tell ODBC, give me the vector of, of Tuple, or give me the vector of column, vector of values for a single column across all tuples. So I think what they're proposing here is that you could, you'd have to rewrite or have your own API at the, at the application server level, or application side API, to support uh, getting these vectors. I actually don't know whether, uh, I don't know whether ODBC is a way to say, give me my result set and just dump it out all at once. I, all the code I've written using JDBC or ODBC has always been like, you know, a while loop of calling get next. Okay. So the benefit we're going to get from this is that if we have everything as, as a column store, then we apply all the techniques that we talked about last week of compressing our data because we know all the values are going to be within the same domain and we're going to get a better compression ratio. So it's the same thing that we talked about before, right? We can do the naive compression approach where we just take, take our, our bytes that we have in our block that we're sending over and we just run gzip on it or snappy, send that over to the, wi the wire, and the client then just, just calls the same, uh, you know, uses the same compression algorithm to, to, uh, to decompress it. The other approach is to do the columnar specific encoding, like RLE or the dictionary encoding or the, the delta encoding. Um, as far as I know, no system actually does this. This does show up in, in some systems, like MySQL will actually use gzip of all things to compress data. So, as they talk about in the paper, this is obviously you're going to get better compression ratio if you have uh, the, the more data you have. Um, and what's also nice about to, uh, for larger blocks, this is actually going to work even better. Um, and they, they say that this is the better way to do this because the, the, the approach is agnostic to what the actual data is. So there's no logic on the client server side to say, oh, I'm looking at this column and it's delta encoding, so I need to now basically replay the delta to get me back the, the original values. If I'm just using Snappy, I just take my byte stream or byte array and just run it through that and then I, I get everything out that I want. The other thing they also talk about in the paper is that if the network is slow, then a more heavyweight algorithm uh, like gzip will be preferable over something like Snappy because you're paying, uh, you know, you're paying a higher CPU overhead cost to get, to get a better compression ratio and that's usually going to be a good trade-off. Again, this, what does this sound like? It sounds like a disk, right? It's, and, which it is. It's essentially a slow piece of hardware that we need to get data through like a straw from one side to the other. So again, if we know it's going to be slow or we're going to have uh, low bandwidth, then we want to do as much work as we can on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, the ingestion and, and reading of the data to, to, to minimize that overhead. So for this reason, they claim that this is better. And like I said, nobody, I don't know of any system that actually does this. Now we get into the question of how we're actually going to represent the data, or how we're going to serialize it. So the first approach is to do binary encoding, where, again, it's just like as we, we talked about when we, when we, we talked about like alignment and, and layout, we would represent the data in, in its binary form. Uh, and that's typically native to whatever like C or simple or what the hardware gives us if we're following the the IEEE 754 standard. So what will happen is the client side will be responsible for handing any in this because the server doesn't know what you actually want. So the server will send it out in, in, you know, in one any in this, and the client says, oh, well, I was told, I, you know, the server's running x86, and therefore it gave me little Indian, but at mine running on my cell phone, I need big Indian. So the client's responsible for, for, for reversing that. But that's not too expensive other than just having, having to copy data. The other thing that's going to be important, too, is that if we can have whatever the format is that the data system uses to store data right, in, in, in the actual columns itself or the, or the rows themselves, if our wire protocol can match this, what we're actually storing, 
then it's gonna be super cheap or, or have low overhead for us to go take data out from the result of a query and then put that into a packet to send that over the wire. So what I mean is that if, if using my our old system as an example, in our old system, we built our execution engine and storage manager separately and then we sort of grafted it onto Postgres. And then when we actually want to go put the, the results of queries into a packet and send it over the Postgres wire protocol, how it represented strings was different than how we represented strings. So we would then have to convert it, right? And basically it means copying the data in, you know, into our original format and copy it out into, into, and convert it to Postgres's format. So that extra copying starts to add up because if you're doing this for every single query and every single tuple and every, and every single result, then that, you're spending all your time just doing copying and serializing, deserializing, which sucks, right? I mean, with Peloton, we had another mistake too. Like, we had like three copies of, of data just to get over the wire protocol. Two of them you needed. One of them was, 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 was superfluous, but it, it's part of the reason why we killed that system. Uh, the other thing you can do too is, instead of implementing your own uh, you know, binary format, for sending over the, the messages, or that you're representing data messages, you actually can rely on these serialization, serialization, open source serialization formats that are out there. Two most famous ones are Google's protocol buffers or Facebook Thrift. Right? Think about this as you, you define in a, in a DSL what a packet looks like, what the types are, and, and so forth. And then they have a way to, then, uh, to compile and generate you code that you can then use to build structs and fill out these, these buffers and then they'll serialize it for you so that you can send it over the network. Um, I don't know of any system that actually does, uses protocol buffers, or flat buffers is the newer version of protocol buffers. I think it's zero copy, so it's faster. Um, Hive uses Thrift. Thrift brings you a bunch of other stuff, like RPC and other, and like other like, uh, networking uh, communication protocol stuff, which is more than maybe you actually want. But uh, Hive is the only one that I know that uses this. So, I would not recommend these things because these are actually going to be a bit uh, uh, verbose, right? Like, they're going to have to record all this extra metadata to tell you what the type actually of the data you're actually storing. In our networking protocol, if we, if we, if we do it ourselves, maybe just in the, the, the header of the packets we send over, say, hey, we're, we're about to send you a bunch of tuples that have these types, here they are. Whereas in these things, I think they, have to, they make multiple copies of that metadata, right, for every single message. So for this reason, I, I, I don't recommend the, this. You want to you want to roll your own. All right. The and it, so in addition, to, you know, the metadata about what my types are, we got to keep track of like how do we actually represent nulls, uh, the sizes of our, of our data, right? All of that gets 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 expensive, and some systems do it better than others. The alternative is that the server just sends over all your data as plain text, right? And so the advantage of this is that you don't have to worry about any of these NDNs. It's up to now the client's responsibility to figure out how to actually interpret what, what it is that you're actually looking at. Right? So think of it this way. So say I have on my server side, I, my, my query result has one, has one tuple, it has one attribute, the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's a 32-bit integer. I can represent it in four bytes. So if I send this over in binary form, I just say, hey, I have a four-byte integer. An alternative could be I could convert 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 into the string of characters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and send that over. Now in that case, assuming I'm ASCII encoded, I need one byte for every single character. I, I have six numbers, so I need six bytes for those. But then depending on how I'm representing either the length or, or say how, you know, how long the thing actually is, I would need an extra byte potentially to say here's a null terminator or here's the length of the string. And then now on the, on the client side, I just call it A2I if you're using C to convert this string into uh, the correct form that they, they, we could then hand off to ODBC or JDBC. So this seems kind of crazy. Why would you actually want, whenever want to do this? Uh, you see this in systems that support uh, essentially JSON types or JSON result sets as, as like the output of, of a query. Um, MonadB, we'll see in a second, actually supports this as well. Uh, I forget why, I think it's just for historical reasons they did this. Um, but as we'll see in the results, you know, storing it in the binary form is, is the better way to do this, always. Okay? All right. All right, the last thing we gotta talk about is how we can actually handle strings, and I sort of mentioned this just now. So the, the three approaches, again, the same thing we actually would wanna do in our database system. 
Do we just do the standard C way and have a null byte at the end of the string to denote the end of the string? So now if I'm parsing the packet that I'm getting over the network, as soon as I see this null terminator character, I know that, that this is the end of the string. Um, and then the advantage of this is that I can use on my client side, I can use all the sort of standard C API string, string functions because they know how to operate on strings with null terminators. The other approach is, again, how we do this natively in our database system, where we just add the length of the string to the beginning of the bytes of the string, so we know the client knows how, how far it needs to jump ahead to find everything you need. The last one would be like a char field instead of a varchar, where you just ha you, you have a fixed size uh, of, 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 of bytes that you use to represent every, every string for every tuple. Well, for every attribute of a tuple, you have a fixed size. And then you just pad out whatever the value is for each individual tuple to fill out the rest of the, the, you know, the, the rest of that size, the rest of that, that, that allocated space. So this seems kind of also wasteful as well, but like if most of my strings are, say, you know, I've, I've specified my chart field to be 16, 16 characters, and most of my strings are eight characters or nine characters, I'm a bunch of zeros, and if I'm using gzip or snappy, that's a good opportunity to get good compression because it's going to see repeated byte sequences over and over again. I think, though, in the, in the paper they discussed that this only really makes sense and gets the best performance if, like, all your strings are, like, one character, right? And then the paper also talk, talks about how sometimes this is faster, sometimes this is faster, right? It, it just depends on what your strings look like. And as far as I know, no system is actually going to implement both. You just pick one and stick with it because it'd be too much engineering overhead, both on the server side and the client side, to have to support both of these. Right. The other thing to point, point, uh, point out too as well is that the performance you're going to get, depending on how you represent strings, is not going to be, is not just, like, in a, you know, independent of just what the, the approach you're using. If I'm doing compression, then sometimes this will be really good and the other ones could be bad. So again, there's a mul multiplicative effect of based on how we're going to design our protocol and what compression scheme we're going to use and what the, what the, we're doing row store versus column store, all of the, the, these things combined will, uh, you know, affect what the performance is going to be. All right, so let's just show two quick, quick graphs. So they did two experiments from the paper. The first one is we're going to go measure the time it takes to send one tuple and the time it takes to send a million tuples. And so they're going to compare against uh, MySQL, both with and without uh, uh, gzip en enabled, Monet DBD, Oracle, MongoDB, DB2, and Hive. So again, although MongoDB doesn't support SQL, uh, they still support ODBC driver. Uh, so this works. So what you see is going across is that uh, Hive is actually going to do the worst here, followed by DB2. But then these other ones here are roughly all about the same. Uh, what's interesting to point out, though, is that MoDB is the only one of these ones doing text encoding, where everything else is doing binary encoding. And it still outperforms the other ones that are doing binary encoding. And as a case of, of, of DB2, I don't know why this is slow. Um, We'll see in the next slide, it's more pronounced. But at least with Oracle and DB2, they have their own confirmation message that the client sends to the server and say, hey, I got what you just sent me. Send me more. And think that's sort of redundant over top of TCP. But you know, maybe it's from a day where you wanted that kind of extra, extra uh, security or extra um, uh, safetyness. And then Hive, I said, is, again, it's just, it's just sending way more data. So for this one, again, this is only one tuple at a time. So the way to avoid all the overhead of like parsing the SQL statement and, and running through the optimizer and running the query, they're going to run the query multiple times and then have the database system cache at least the query plan. Not the result, but at least the query plan. So this is just saying what's the overhead of constructing the packet that we send over the wire protocol. In the next experiment, they're going to then send back a million tuples. Um, and so the first two results to point out, though, is uh, with MySQL. So this, is my, so this is when, the, the, along the x-axis, we're going to vary the latency of these network messages. So when your network is really fast, uh, up until this point here, the regular MySQL protocol without any compression is, is going to be better. But once, obviously, the network gets slower, then you know, doing that extra CPU work to compress the data actually pays off. In this case here, my, the MySQL with compression, it always gets the same performance because the dominant cost here is it's calling gzip. For all the other ones, again, the, the curves look all about the same, right? Obviously, when they're faster, uh, when the network gets faster, they do better. But as the network gets slower, they do worse. Um, 
What's interesting to point out, though, over here is that Oracle is, is the second fastest one after MySQL here when, when the network is fast. But then up here, it actually ends up being one of the slowest ones. Um, I don't remember why the paper said that why this was the case. Um, I mean, DB2 here is, is an order of magnitude off of like Postgres, right? I, so DB2 is like doing like 500, uh, is that 500 up there? And Oracle, or sorry, Postgres right below it is around like 10 or 50 seconds. So that's just an example of like how that confirmation message that they're sending over is super inefficient when the network is slow. Like they can't send the next batch of tuples to the client until you get that second round trip to say, hey, send me more. All right, so any questions about this? Yes? Um, why is MySQL lesser than MySQL plus Is it bad? Sorry, this, 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 line, this point here? Yeah. Why is this faster than this? Yeah. Because I'm sending back a million tuples. I, I don't remember the exact size of that. But like, when the network's really fast, I don't want to pay the penalty to compress it. I just want to shove it over the wire as fast as possible. And this one here, the dominant cost is, is the CPU overhead of compressing and decompressing. So that's why, again, it, it's basically flatlined. So no matter how much slower the network get, gets, the benefit you're getting from sending less data over a slower network is negated by the, the computational cost of this. Now, they could have used Snappy. And that, that, might, that might change the curves a bit. But it's basically, this is basically saying, and why I highlighted this one first, is that when the network is fast, you don't want to do any compression. You just want to shove data out as fast as possible. But as the network gets slower, uh, you do want to do this. So you now say, all right, well, in what case would the network get be like 100 milliseconds? Well, if I'm running in different data centers, the application server is running one data center, the data server is running another one, then you know I can get up to 100 milliseconds latencies. Yes. Can you look into your like, network uh, bandwidth and tell latency? Because like, if you have um, bandwidth but different latency, you basically have like um, the same ending rate, except that you have that uh, extra um, couple nodes that can end the latency. Your statement is shouldn't they be shouldn't they be varying the bandwidth and not the latency? Because I mean they're related to each other, but I think like. The, like in the case of like DB2, like it's sending those confirmation messages, right. that's not a bandwidth issue. That's a late. Like, yeah, that's, that's an RTP issue. But if, if you say like uh, MySQL and MySQL Q-zip, yeah. they're basically, like, I mean, like what Larry says, the latency is different. Yeah. Like, if you're using a different kind of bandwidth, then it's the same thing. Here, you see, yeah, his statement is that, uh, let's take this offline, because I don't know exactly, I, like, I don't remember what the exact setup was, like, in terms of like, I think the, the client has to get the result and immediately throw it away, but in this case here, the client, so that the cost of decompressing on the client side is, is being measured in this as well. So that, I think that's why the, the, and you can't hide that, I think that's why the latency matters. More than, than bandwidth. Let's do, let's do that, that one offline. Okay. Um, we have 20 minutes. Um, I'm actually going to skip replication protocols. I think we covered this in the. We basically covered this in, in the intro class already. Uh, the only thing I have to say too is like that the. Um, sort of relating to what we talked about last class with like logging and recovery. Sometimes you do logical logging, sometimes you do uh, physical logging, right? And that's a, an, an internal protocol that the data system uses that's going to be separate than the client protocol you would use to, to communicate with it, like ODBC and JDBC. Um, and some of the optimizations you can do, again, for doing compression and other things, or how you batch up the, the log records depends on what the consistency guarantees you want for your, 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 your systems. So that one will, there's not much more to say other than, other than that. Um, but we can talk about that offline if you want as well. All right, so just to finish up real quickly, because this is something I think I, I do want to expose you guys to. Um, the, in the experiments with, 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 uh, from the, the DuckDB guys' paper, like, as I was showing, like, they're, they're, they're varying the network latency, but that's not the only bottleneck you're going to have. The network layer itself is not the only bottleneck you're going to have in your, in, your app, in your database server to communicate with the client. Oftentimes, the, the OS is going to cause problems, especially if you're doing uh, O2B applications where you're sending a lot of small packets instead of you know, you know, giant, giant buffers of things. 
And the reason why it's going to be expensive is because communicating with the OS is always going to be a nightmare for us as the database system, right? It's our frenemy. We need it to survive, but it, it always gets in our way. So if we were going to lie on the OS's TCP, excuse me, TCP IP stack, then we have to have context switches, handle through, inter, uh, through interrupts in order to get, you know, to be notified that we have now a packet that we want to get, copying data out from our buffers in the database server down into the TCP IP buffers that we send into the kernel. That's going to be expensive. And of course, the OS is going to maintain its own latches to protect its internal data structures, and those are going to get in our way if we have a lot of threads trying to write to data at the same time. So one way to avoid all this is through what's called a kernel bypass methods. And the idea here is that we're going to have the database system, we're going to implement it so that we're going to be able to write data directly to the NIC, to the actual, you know, the hardware, the network device, uh, by going around the OS, right? And so the idea is that we can now have a buffer of data that we can fill in with, uh, with the results of a query or the packets we want to send over using our wire protocol, but that buffer actually now lives down in the NIC, so we don't have to do any copying to hand it off to the hardware. The hardware can get, fill up the buffer and we say, all right, we're done with it, and then now we can immediately go over the wire and send over our messages. So the OS doesn't get in the way at all. So there's two ways to do this. Um, there's the, the data plane development kit and the DPDK, and then there's through, through RDMA, or remote direct memory access. So they're not exactly, it's not a true apples to apples comparison because like the DPDK is a library you can download uh, originally from Intel that provides this, uh, this kernel bypass method. RDMA is sort of a, a category of hardware and software libraries you, you, that you, you can get for your system. So there's, there's a, the point I'm trying to make is there's a specific thing you can download called the DPDK Right, that, that is a library. There's no like single library called RDMA you can download. It's, it's a broader concept. Okay. So uh, with the DBDK, the idea here is that uh, it's it's this library that Intel originally developed uh, in order to help them sell their in Intel's hardware. But they eventually donated the software to the Linux Foundation. And the idea here is that it's a bunch of libraries that uh, or API calls that allows us to access the NIC directly. We can say, give us a buffer that's on the NIC. We can then fill it up. And then we can then tell the, the NIC to go ahead and write, write our data to this location. So we're almost treating like the, the, the NIC as like a bare metal device. Yes? Is that NIC buffer like on the NIC itself or is it in memory? This question is, where's the buffer actually live? I actually don't know. I mean, the NIC has its own memory buffer. I, I, think, you can, I think when you say, give me a, a in, through DPK, when you get a buffer for it, I mean, when you first do your write, I think it lives in the CPU cache, because it has to, because that's where you write everything. But then when it gets flushed, it doesn't get flushed to DRAM, it gets flushed to the NIC. I think that's how it works. So does it also get context switched with everything else that comes in? Uh, like, th does the NIC? Like when, like when the OS does context switch, does it, I'm assuming it also Oh, the question is, oh yeah, so if, I, if, I'm, if my process is writing to, this, to the cache lines that are backed by the NIC, if I get a context switch, does that then get flushed? I think so, yes. Like, the OS, the OS doesn't control any of this data movement. It's, it's the hardware is actually providing this functionality for us, right? And you know, Intel, in their, in their world, they're trying to sell hardware, so that they're making it easier for you to write to their hardware. I, for the DPDK, I don't I mean Intel, I, Intel, it came out of Intel, but now it's supposed to be this, this, this broader thing that other vendors can implement. I don't know whether you can get this with other, anything else that's not an Intel NIC. Um, so again, there's no data copying, because we can write directly into the buffers that are on, on the NIC. Uh, and there's no system calls to send any messages. We're basically going directly from, from our database server to the hardware and say, send our messages to this location. The OS doesn't get involved at all. It's awesome. So for as amazing as this sounds, uh, there's only one database system that I'm aware of that actually uses this. And it's called ScaliaDB. So they implemented this framework called CSTAR. Uh, which is a networking framework that uses the DBDK, and then ScaliaDB is built on top of it. ScaliaDB is a C++ re-implementation of Cassandra. Cassandra is really originally written in, in Java. This is really now written in C++ and using DBDK to get faster uh, messages, right? So as amazing as it sounds, as I said, this is not that common. If you, you can get instances on EC2 that do support the DBDK, but it's not like you know, the, the cheapo ones that we were running on this class. They don't support this. Um, the other tricky thing, too, is like this sounds amazing and it's kind of seductive, uh, but someone tweeted at me once about, the, uh, about using SBDK as the storage one, this is the data one. Like, 
this comment I think is fantastic. Like, it seems like it's gonna be a really good idea, uh, but then when you really start pushing it, then it's all these nuances of it that start trip you up. Right? It's not something you can just like plop in like link in a library and you, you automatically get it. You have to rewrite your database server application or database server to use this. Right? And that, that could be a major change. Change. In the case of SCLEADB, they're built on top of C star, so all the 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 complexities of the DBDK are hidden underneath the covers. So for this reason, as I said, like uh, because you have to rewrite your, your server, I don't not many uh, database systems actually use this. The other one is the RDMA. And the idea here is that the, if I have multiple machines, uh, I, can have the, uh, I can have the client or the server write and read and write the memory location of that remote machine. So the way you think about this is like if my application server, if my, if my client driver for my database server knew of the memory layout of the, of the data in, on the database server, then instead of sending now a SQL query, to go have that be parsed, and executed, and, and then send back the results at, I could, if I know how the, the data is laid out, I could just read directly into memory and get the, get the result I want back. That's actually super hard, right? Because now if I start moving memory around, then everything, everything is going to get messed up. Um, so the only two systems that I'm aware of that actually use RDMA, the most famous one is Oracle Rack. Right, or it's basically you know a multi-million dollar uh, uh, cabinet of of, of high-end servers that use RDMA to, to talk to each other within the rack. Right, in that case, Oracle has designed this system specifically to to do shared memory buffers uh, using RDMA. Farm is a distributed transactional system out of Microsoft Research. I don't think it's actually running production. Um, but the tricky thing about RDMA is like you don't know whether someone's accessing your memory or, you know, or writing your memory, right? Because it's all handled through the hardware. It's all hidden from you from the OS. So it's not like I, I get an interrupt to say, oh, someone wrote to memory uh, at this location. I don't know. So in order to do transactions correctly and, and farm, when you have you know, one server writing to a memory of another server, they basically have to do four-phase commit over RDMA, which is faster, but it's four-phase commit to be able to say, all right, I've made these changes. Are you OK with that, right? So uh, again, for this reason, you, all, like, you would you only use RDMA internally to communicate between servers of the same database instance. I don't know. No, I, there's been no work, as far as I know of, about doing RDMA uh, from the client to, to, the, to the server. Because if memory gets moved around, then, then, uh, then you're screwed. So I want to show one quick graph on this. So this is an experiment that a, a former student of mine did on, the, on our system where we just want to see how, how fast we can get 7 gigabytes of, of tuples out of, uh, out of, out of TPC, or from TPCC. Um, the, the protocol is that the client is actually reading into memory. It knows where the layout, uh, uh, the starting, uh, starting and stopping addresses for all the blocks of data that it wants to read is sort of how fast can we get, get everything out. So at the low end, you have, if you have Postgres, where you're actually iterating and going through the Postgres wire protocol, um, if you then do what the DuckDB guys proposed in the paper you read about vectorizing the blocks you send back, you can do a little bit better. Aeroflight is a gRPC implementation or, or RPC implementation of getting raw blocks of data out uh, from the Aero guys. But the RDMA is like the bare bones. Like if I know exactly the memory address that I want, uh, and I can just jump to that location on the remote machine and get all the data back I need. So this just shows you again your your you can get about an order of magnitude performance improvement. If you don't worry about going through any of that sort of any other database server, server software, okay. All right. So this is a bit rushed at the end, uh, but and I've covered most of this already. Right. So the, the network protocol is is something that we sort of take advantage of, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for performance improvements, uh, and this is what the DuckDB guys showed. The problem is though, you have all of these drivers out in the wild, uh, and in some ways now the protocol is sort of set in stone. Uh, it'd be a major change to go back and, and, and have everyone link in new libraries. That's never going to happen. But now, if you want to be able to update your, your protocol and support more, some of these optimizations, you, you essentially need to support both. Because you never know when a client's going to show up and, and connect with, with the old protocol. The, uh, uh, so Mike Stonebreaker told me that when they were building Vertica, one of the things, the big things they spent a lot of time on, because they wanted to be Postgres compatible, is that they basically found every single jar file they could of the Postgres wire protocol that was out there 
and just ran every single test over and over again. And like, because there's so many just sort of one-off variances of them, they spent a lot of time making it just be Postgres JDBC compatible because it's super hard. And the kernel bypass methods we saw, again, these are just optimizations to avoid the OS, avoid having to go through the front end layer, but uh, it's, more, it's usually more work than, than it's actually worth. Okay? All right, so quickly, uh, project two. So the, the plan for project two is that everyone's going to implement in the team uh, your own B plus tree, an in memory B plus tree that has to be thread safe. That means you have to support splits and merges and have multiple threads accessing the, 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 the index at the same time. So the basic API you're going to have to implement is insert, get, delete, range, and range scans. You also have to support conditional inserts. And the way that works is I call insert with a key, but I also pass you a lambda function that says that you need to evaluate on the key. And if that lambda function evaluates to true, then you're allowed to insert. Otherwise, you can't. Right? That's basically how you can do, like, I don't want to say compare and swap, but like to, to replace a value at, an, a, replace a key value pair without having to do multiple traversals or lock the whole thing. You need to support uh, forward and reverse range scans. That means you need sibling pointers. And you got to support unique and non-unique keys. So that's all we're going to tell you you have to do. There will be, will be some, 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 some sub APIs or sub files, class files we'll give you. How you actually want to implement this is left up, to, left up entirely to you. Right? You can't do something stupid like go take STL map, put a latch in front of it, and just have that you know, be your, your tree. It has to be a real B plus tree. But all, whatever optimizations you want to do for like compression, uh, uh, if you want to do, uh, make it latch free or not latch free, or uh, how you actually implement the traversal itself and, and do the search within the node, that's up to entirely to you. Yes? What's the key type? The key type, will be, so we, we already provide that, provide that for you. So it's templatized. Right? So there'll be, there's two types, there's compact ins key and generic key. Generic key is just a, a byte array. So you don't have to write it in the code to do the evaluation of keys. We handle all that for you. And the key type is, you'll know the size of it. So you just, you just pack that into how you want to sort in each node. Right? It's all, with all that staying curve. You're basically just building the, the data structure. OK. So this is already what I said. So we'll provide you with the header file and the API you have to build. And then all this other crap will do for you. So you don't have to worry about how to serialize the keys or get them out, actually do comparisons. All that is handled. So as I said, there's a bunch of design decisions you're going to have to make, and there's no right answer. Sometimes there'll be wrong answers. Like if I, you know, should I write everything to dev null? No, that's wrong. Um, but like, you don't need to come and ask us, like, can I do this, can I do this at every single step? It's up for you guys to decide how you actually want to implement this. And I can point you to, uh, you know, a couple, there's a, the, the book on B plus trees, it's not specific to in-memory B plus trees, but like, there's a book and some papers I could show you. Like, here's some other things you could do to potentially make this go faster. Okay. So we'll provide you with a basic C++ unit test for your implementation. It's basically the same unit test we have for the BW tree, and we just did a search and replace and replace it with B plus tree. Right? But it's not going to be that exhaustive. It's certainly not going to test the internal data structure uh, correctness or integrity that, that you want to have. Right? It's done at a logical level. Like, if I, if I insert this key, do I get that key back? But how do I know that my, uh, you know, that I don't have any empty nodes hanging around, right? We'll, ch we'll check for memory leaks and things like that. But, like, I, you, you're going to want to write your own test that actually tests the, at the low-level data structure, right? Because we don't know how your thing is implemented, so we can't provide you with things. And we'll also do a, um, we'll do a leaderboard to see who has the fastest one. It's going to run on Grayscope, which is not ideal because it's single-threaded, but at least we can see how, how fast you are compared to that. Um, and then we'll give extra bonus points for the top three implementations. The other thing you have to do is also write documentation about what your code is actually doing and explain what you did in all the different parts of the system. So for this, there is a basic check in Doxygen. We use Doxygen to make sure that you actually have like, comments for every single function. But obviously, Doxygen can't read the comments and see what, it, what you're saying is actually correct. So Matt and I would go through and inspect all of these uh, manually. So again, we will plan is to run some additional stress tests for, uh, for your, 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 your implementation beyond what we're going to uh, give you already. And then it will give you extra points for uh, whoever that is the fastest. Um, and then you make sure, that, again, all your code has to follow the, the formatter and linter stuff. One of the things we did actually do, uh, Ian and another student actually made the linter go faster. So now you don't have to you know, take all the cores in your machine and look at every single file. The linter only looks at what, what files you've changed. So it sh that should run faster as well. Okay? I posted this on Piazza last night. Uh, everyone, it's a group project, so it would be 
with 35 students, there should be three groups, or sorry, 12 groups of three people, and then one two-person group project. Um, don't assume you'll be that two-person project. We only have one. Um, so, so please start finding a form of group. Uh, and then on the, on the sign-up, there's that list for free agents. If you don't have a group to be in, add yourself there, and then you know, teams can reach out to you and try to get you to, to join them. Okay? So uh, the website's not up yet. We'll take care of that today. I think Matt pushed the stub files to, to GitHub so you can pull down the latest version of, of, of our new project branch. And then this will be due on, on March 15th. The goal is obviously to have Grayscope up as soon as possible so uh, you know, it's not like a week or two before the deadline. Okay? Any questions about this? All right, this might be fun, right? It's, 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 uh, it's for you guys to be a creative and do whatever you want to do and see who, see who has the fastest one, okay? All right, so next week, our, we'll start talking about actually now how to start executing queries. And this is where we're actually gonna spend a lot of our time for the rest of the semester. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna organize and, and, and schedule threads and our processing models for queries. Then we'll end up talking about query compilation. Um, but at this point, it's really, we're focusing on, now we know the, how to index things and, and store things and send things over the network. How do we actually execute queries? Because so that's the whole point of a database system. You want to get SQL queries and be able to run them and produce answers. Okay? All right, guys. Enjoy your weekend. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the O-E because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the S-T-I. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Hook like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. Just dropped up, this ain't eyes hopped off, and my hood won't be the same. After Ice Cube, take a say I to the brain. Yeah.